Hita, I have a weird question to start this out with. Oh, let's do it. Okay. Can you remember where you were when you've had your latest creative breakthrough? What were you doing at the time? Um, the the one that that actually okay, I was probably totally not going to help you at all. Oh, good. <laughs> but, but I live for those kinds of sites. It's actually it was this show. It was it was coming up with the this the concept of you and I talking about our anxieties, and that I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing and to whom I owe it. What can you give us an example of what you were doing? Well, I, I was sitting in a uh, a live recording of. Uh, the uh, My Brother, My Brother and Me podcast uh, in Seattle, Washington. And right at that conference. That's right. That's right. At, at PodCon uh, the year before last and uh, or last year was the first PodCon, whenever it was. And they got a question from the audience uh, about a, uh, a woman who worked in a, or a wedding store who often found people who uh, smelled really good. But she wanted a non weird way to ask them or to right. tell them that they smelled good. And right. I thought. Holy cow. I am so anxious. We need That's to do a right. podcast. I knew yeah. all this because you talked about this in your first probably in the very so. first yes. episode. This yeah, you're very repetitive. About that. So well, thanks for <laughs> leading me into that. Uh, so <laughs> next week. No, we're still going. Um, that will actually, that's a great example and will actually work with what I wanted to talk about, which is oh, good. the science okay. of creativity. Now, there is a basic sort of cliche that you come up with great ideas in the shower. You've heard of that. Yeah, I don't do that kind of stuff in the shower. Uh, <laughs> uh, fair enough. Um, <laughs> but I don't want to go down that road at all. But what I do want to say is there is actually science behind that of why you have great ideas in the shower or driving home from work. Something that is, well, that has three things. Can I list the three things for you, please? Please. There's actually a huge amount of information about this, but I really tried to boil it down. A lot of my information comes from a blog post by Leo Widridge. There are three things that really are involved. Number one, an important factor is the release of dopamine. We've talked about dopamine endlessly on this podcast. It's the inside drug in your head that makes you feel good. Uh, and so when you're taking things like a, a, doing something relaxing, like taking a warm shower, there's an increase in dopamine levels. Uh, but dopamine alone is triggered in hundreds of events. That's not enough for this whole shower creativity thing that I'm making up as I go along. <laughs> the second crucial factor is, says Harvard researcher Carson, do not have his full name. It might be Carson. Harvard researcher Carson like Daly. Charday. Yeah, he is. He's a real Madonna. Is, you know what? Let me just say that would be great if more academics went by first names only. That's true. Yeah. Like Chardet, Beyonce. Like, we need more. You want to change academia? You've got to go by a fancy stage name. That's all yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Neuroscientist Kyle. I guess that's not very. <laughs> I picked the least fancy name in the world. Okay. Steve. Anyways. <laughs> the other, the second crucial factor is distraction. Because if you, you're you looking directly at the problem or trying to think of the idea or anything, um, you are sort of get lost in it. Jumping into a shower can turn into what scientists call the, quote, incubation period for your mm. mind, for the ideas. That the subconscious mind uh, that has been work, working extremely hard to solve the problem at hand now can sort of wander. And it can surface and plant those ideas in your conscious mind. And number three, with a bullet, a relaxed state of mind is crucial. Uh, author Jonah Lehrer wrote, oh, Jonah Lehrer. Oh, no. <laughs> I just copy pasted this part. He is a noted plagiarist. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he got fired from the New York Times and Wired. OK, well, it's too late. It's too late to go back. <laughs> author Jonah Lehrer either wrote or read something and then wrote, <laughs> when our minds are at ease, we're more likely to direct the spotlight of attention inward toward the stream of remote associations emanating from the right hemisphere. In contrast, when we're really focused on something, we are directed outward towards the details of the problem we are trying to solve. Another way to sort of wrap that up is, while this pattern of attention is necessary when solving problems analytically, it actually prevents us from detecting the connections that can lead to insights. And that's why you need dopamine, distraction, and a relaxed state of mind. Probably you were involved with at least two of those three at that convention. You were relaxed because you really liked that podcast. You were distracted yes. because people were talking. And then maybe, hopefully, you were relaxed because it's not like you were giving the speech. You were just listening. Hallelujah to all of those points. Absolutely. And so the basic thing to take away is generally with all of your problems, the answers have been there all along. You just haven't been listening. And I'm taking bad showers. <laughs> and you really have to try turning the water on once. <laughs> it changes everything, Pete. You've, you've really got to roll the dice. <laughs> Welcome 
to What's That Smell, a sometimes funny podcast about humans and their anxieties. I'm Tommy Metz III. And I'm Pete Wright. And every week, we each drag out one of our deepest, darkest anxieties into the light to share it, learn about it, and hopefully laugh about it with all of you. Reach out. Don't forget to send us the story of your anxieties to something stinky at what's that smell dot net. Again, something stinky at what's that smell dot net. Tommy. Yes, I've got I've got one for you. Woohoo! Tommy? Ah, yes. It's it's time. Are you I okay? don't know. Yeah, that really got exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got something for you. This is a visioning exercise. Remember how we do this from time to time? Uh, I am not good at them, but I love them. Let's do mm, it. I love it. I love it. So this is, uh, if, if you recall, the, the setup for the exercise, I need you to close your eyes and I need you to get very, very relaxed. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, and now I'm, I think that you will recognize when we reach the phobia that I'm, I'm going to be introducing today. But in case it's not clear, I just want you to react instinctively. When we get to a point where there's something that irks you in some way, in any way, mm -hmm. just let me have it, okay? <laughs> yep. Are we, are we cool? All right. Yes. So here we are. Let's, let's take you back. You leave your, uh, your apartment and you walk outside and you're going to walk across the street in your bare feet because this is a visioning exercise and that Another means you're relaxed. Another barefoot thing. All right. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you go across the street. I think there's some sort of a construction zone over there. Mm -hmm. some, there's some sort of a, a dirty playground, wherever that is. That's where you are because it's a place where you're, you're relaxed and right. you're, you're feeling the breeze. You hear some traffic, but it's it's slowly, it's like dissipating. It's like fading away okay. in the background, okay? You feel the air, the breeze, and uh, and you're making fists with your toes in the grass or the dirt or debris. <laughs> Pete? You're not doing very well. I need you to focus. Pete? I need you to stay with me. This is, okay, something is irking me. We're not there yet, all right? Oh. Would you just relax? Relax. Oh. I, we've done this before. All right? But wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something, something different this time. There's, there's something. There is? There's like a feeling, maybe a tingling or a poking of some sort. It's on your, it's down on your foot. So what? you look down and moving slowly across the top of your foot, sprawling from one side to the other across the top of your foot, a large brown spider. Ah, what's happening? <laughs> I'm so uncomfortable because you've already done some of this. I've already been barefoot in a yeah. construction zone. Yeah. And now you're bringing up a spider. I don't exactly know how to feel. Spider. I'm how afraid feel? that you've... Bad. How do you feel? I feel like I'm taking that, <laughs> that weird test in Blade Runner because I don't... I am human, right. but I feel like I That's can't right. prove it to you. This one comes from a listener. This is uh, from listener Melissa. Thank you so much, Melissa, for writing us and for offering this particular phobia. Uh, and that is, of course arachnophobia you're not afraid of money and you're not afraid of the country falling apart probably arachnophobia is right up there and so <laughs> i would like to share with you what uh, melissa has written to us she writes so now to my anxiety du jour she says mm, oh. in french uh, I tossed a couple of ones back and forth and debated which would be worth sharing. As anyone who suffers from anxiety knows, just like Pringles, you can't have just one. Uh, <laughs> this, this anxiety sponsored by Pringles. Uh, if you are a natural worrier, it's improbable that there is only one thought that plagues your waking moments. The anxiety, yeah, like we are a testament for that. Uh, the anxiety <laughs> that haunts me, the phobia that will keep me glued to one spot or possibly running and flailing around like I'm on fire is arachnophobia. Oof. To this day, I'm not sure where the fear originated, but I can attest that unlike many of the anxieties I've heard you both discuss on previous episodes, this fear has magnified in intensity as I've gotten older. Oh. When I was younger, yeah, right? When I was younger, I would only have a problem with a living spider in close proximity to myself. Now that I have recently celebrated the sixth anniversary of my 25th birthday, so I don't have to acknowledge I'm getting older, <laughs> I can't even stand a picture of a spider. Even saying or hearing the word spider will increase my blood pressure and I start to get twitchy, absently brushing off my arms and back. 
of my yep. neck and will catch myself glancing into corners of the yep. ceiling or looking for assumed predators. <laughs> Ants. Yes, yes. <laughs> I 100% even, on all of that. Go ahead. E- even typing this now is causing my muscles to clench. So to keep myself from a full-blown panic attack, I think I'll end my note here. <laughs> now, as someone who has an ant thing, uh, it seems like your response to spiders was not uh, at the same level. No, the spider was uh, that actually just <laughs> confused me <laughs> in your amazing <laughs> thought experiment that I still don't understand. Uh, but um, no, I do not have the same, which is strange. I mean, um, I would think most yeah. people would have much more of a feeling about spiders than they do ants. But her talking about any look eyes darting around the room, psychosomatic brushing of the hands and arms. I completely, completely get that. I yeah. really have that. So I can definitely um, empathize with that side of it. Yeah, I I can too. And and you know, I don't I don't like I don't like the spider. I don't have the oh, I mean, don't. I brush off okay. the skin. I don't like I don't have the full-blown phobia of them. Uh but uh I do get a, a little bit wiggy, especially when they're in my house. Those you know, those house spiders. They get the house spiders. They get really sure. big, right? They Ew. get they get big. I don't like them. I see them crawling on the ceiling. I don't like it. And I my rationalization here, my justification is that I don't go hang out in their house. <laughs> So get the hell out of mine. Uh, I see. Sure. That's how nature works. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a very American <laughs> kind of way of thinking. I like that. You know, it's really funny you should say that. Oh. This was an interesting uh, little segue you gave us here. Uh, there are two perspectives on the phobia uh, that is of spiders and spiders and other arachnids like scorpions and things. Uh, one is evolutionary. And we've talked a little bit about the evolutionary part. Uh, mm-hmm. in, in fact, in 2001, uh, Oman and Estevez uh, actually wrote Ooh. a paper called Emotion Drives Attention, Detecting the Snake in the Grass in the Journal oh. of Experimental Psychology. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and they found in that study that people could now get a load of this. See if you can parse this. They found that people could detect images of spiders among images of flowers and mushrooms more quickly than they could detect images of flowers or mushrooms among images of spiders. Uh, 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 oh, so like a whole bunch of spiders and stuff. We have trouble picking out the anomaly if it's a flower because all we care yes. about is spider, spider, spider. If I am walking through a f- green field or a field of flowers, I'm going to be able to look down and spot that spider very, very quickly. And Why? that, they say, is their argument for evolution, that uh, that this was because a fast response to spiders is relevant to us keeping ourselves safe. Right. Like mm-hmm. any evolutionary impact, the theory goes that the arachnophobe considers a spider free home as reducing risk to life and limb. You know, I, I look at this. I, I look at our, our uh, uh, we have a dear friend, uh, Andy, uh, who lives mm-hmm. in Arizona. Right. Um, Ooh, friend of the show, uh, Andy. It's it's bad for bugs, but in particular, uh, scorpions. Yes, I I do hate scorpions. Why? Clash of the Titans. Let me go on. Andy (laughs) tells me he says I need to go outside uh, in the evening with my black light and a hammer because the scorpions uh, will climb on the wall around my pool, and I don't want my kids to get stung. So I have to go pop them with the hammer and and kill the scorpions with a Ah. black light and a hammer. I am wildly uncomfortable with that. Wildly, wildly uncomfortable w- yes. with that. Okay. Yes. That is a horrible thing. That is a horrible uh, hobby. <laughs> <laughs> he does it not only at his house, but really for the whole neighborhood. He just yeah. likes it so much. That's his uh, part of distraction to get that exactly. dopamine in. <laughs> He's got his, <laughs> exactly. his relaxation hammer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's the, the that's the sort of evolutionary thing, right? If you're an arachnophobe, you think that this is going to, uh, you know, you have this natural evolutionary bent to keeping yourself safe. Uh, in spite of the fact that uh, the evidence says most spiders are are not going to hurt you. Most spiders are just more bugs. That's what I was going to ask about 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 that in a minute. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because evolution. I mean, it seems like that means that spiders really posed a real threat way back then. And 
do today, but only some of them, right? Uh, okay. Of the of the three thousand spiders, let's just say in the United States, of the three thousand species of spiders that call the U.S. Uh, North America residents, uh, they're not poisonous, right? The right. majority of them are not poisonous, and in fact, there are really only a handful, according to uh, this particular uh, resource, this particular article. This is you just got to be on the lookout for uh, these five, right? The brown recluse, the black widow, the hobo spider, the tarantula, and the Brazilian wandering spider. Uh, is the hobo spider o- only found on like boxcar trains? <laughs> That's right. It's a train spider. Do, do you are you familiar with any of those uh, spiders? Have you ever come in contact with them? I don't think so. I know I've heard of like things like the brown recluse, and I just in, I just assume that he's like shy. The hobo spider, um, the boxcar <laughs> train spider. This is one that that I know more about because it is common in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, and okay. it, so it's it's up high. It's on long legs. It runs very fast. Yeah. Uh, and and it it may attack when provoked. So come on. Like, why do oh. we why are we afraid of spiders when we use language like it attacks when provoked? Yeah. Right. Of course. R- real quick, Pete. I just want to do a welfare check on Melissa. Melissa, oh, yeah. <laughs> you doing OK? That was a lot of adjectives and a lot of verbs and none of them were fun. Just so you know, we understand if you need to bite size this episode or just go ahead and call Turn an it ambulance. Up. Go to the next chapter. Skip on. Tommy's got some yeah. good stuff to talk about, I'm sure. OK, back to these hobo spiders. Uh, it, the wound, get a load of this. It will become hardened and swollen after oh. an hour. And then after 24 to 26 hours, it will discharge fluids and turn <gasps> black. All right. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, purple blue at the puncture site, visual Mm. or oral disruption, oral disruption. And I mean oral, A-U-R-A-L. You can hear it disrupt. Stop. It's like popping. I'm good. I don't want it anymore. Joint pain. So uh, hobo spider bites are definitely bites you want to not playing uh, around. No. Yeah. You're not not playing around there. And uh, and so then we get back to the tarantula is the one we always uh, think about. I the famous one. It's a famous one because it's big and hairy and they but they aren't aggressive. Uh, in, in fact, the venom from the U.S. species of tarantulas, it, it feels like a bee sting, right? It becomes warm and red, these bites, but it's not considered typically dangerous in the U.S. And finally, the Brazilian wandering spider. I don't know why we're worried about that, <laughs> mostly because it's so stupid it wandered here from Brazil. Uh, <laughs> but it is extremely painful uh, and can, again, result in, get get this, Heavy sweating and drooling. What is that all about? What's this drooling oh, part? Oh, I don't know. The drooling I find very uncomfortable. Maybe worse than the bite. This can uh, result in dead tissue or death around the uh, around the area. There is sure. antivenom available. You should seek treatment immediately. Uh, you know, there are lots and lots of spiders. Those are the big ones. Jumping spider, camel spider, wolf spider. These are all uh, ugh, very uncomfortable. The jumping spider. Ugh, that's one I don't like. <laughs> What's with it? So giving a spider that horrible look and allowing it to jump is a, a horrible crime of evolution. So that's the thing about evolution and the evolutionary approach to the spider fear. There, mm-hmm. Is there reason to be afraid of spiders? Yes, because of all the drooling. Clearly, is <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, but also, the bites can hurt. But generally, I mean, when we can we we can ca- you know capture all of the 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 most dangerous spiders in a, a, a handful uh, of a list, it just it's irrational, and that's what makes it a phobia to be afraid of spiders. So then we have to turn the table and look at this from a cultural perspective. If the phobia was truly universal universal and based on evolution, it would be something that we could extrapolate to the rest of the planet. But what if we go to Cambodia? Well, I'm so glad uh, you would like to go to Cambodia with me because (laughs) in Cambodia, fried spider is a delicacy. Oh, sure. Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. fried spider and i'm talking specifically about a breed of tarantula here that uh is called the ah ping it's about two inches across and it's said to taste like crunchy fried prawns Mm -hmm. Ah! Mm -hmm. oh why would you not tell me you're putting a picture up oh Oh, because i wanted to surprise you because you did that whole visioning exercise like such a chump i needed some (laughs) sort of response (laughs) crying out loud Oh, those can you look, please? What is the opposite of delicious? <laughs> can you can oh you please God. describe what I have just sent you? Sure. Um, uh, they look like giant spiders with their legs all spread out, 
but with a delicious breadcrumb coating. That was hard to say, breadcrumb coating. Uh, I don't know. They look like they just look like a huge pile of uh, nightmares on a plate to me. That's uh, that is it. It does. It does look a little bit like a nightmare on a plate, and uh, it is. This this is from the town of Scuon, which is about forty five miles away from Phnom Penh, and uh, they they eat a this. It's an Asian tarantula, uh, and uh, they're deep fried with a little uh, salt and garlic, and the locals eat them like they eat a crab. They pull off the legs and they suck out the meat. Pete, I'm I'm honestly getting nauseous. <laughs> Look, evolution be damned. Do you ever <sighs> s- sort of wonder if there's a culture here, maybe that where people live in <laughs> desperate fear of chickens? <laughs> Like, <laughs> we just don't know any better or some, some like incredibly sure. sweet animal yeah <laughs> right. oh my gosh those earthworms they're gonna get me i actually have this nat geo video uh, of a boy eating these spiders and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes um even the abdomen uh, there the pictures of mm. people popping these live tarantulas right in their mouths right mm. uh, it's so uh, and it, it, i should say if you're truly interested in investing in lifestyle change which to get over this phobia as you can imagine uh this sort of exposure therapy might really help you i encourage you to pick up the book the Eat a Bug Cookbook Revised, 40 Ways to Cook Crickets, Grasshoppers, Ants, Water Bugs, Spiders, Centipedes, and Their Kin by David George Gordon, who is clearly an artist in the yeah. kitchen. Actually, uh, I, re- I read that one. The revision just says don't. <laughs> <laughs> Get uh, Jack in the Box or something. Yes. What, are you crazy? No, because I know that crick- there's a huge groundswell of people trying to make crickets. A thing, because they're incredibly yeah. good for you. I don't know about spiders, but crickets are incredibly good for you. They're obviously all over the place. And I've watched shark after shark pass on <laughs> cricket-based food <laughs> as they're like, we're not going to do this because the nope. the ability for people to change their minds enough, I would think, yeah, it would be really hard. But I, I actually bring this up for a reason, because one of the uh, sort of methods of getting over a, a fear like this is to demonstrate that you can exert a power over it. And what better way can you think of to exert your power and influence over something that gives you fear than by eating it? You would be consuming what you were afraid of. There is something very primal in that. That makes sense. Something very primal in that. And I, I think that there, there might be something to it. Even though I look at these pictures, again, we'll post those in the show notes, and I think, nope. Yeah, don't. <laughs> there is not a big enough hammer. Uh, <laughs> there's not enough big hammer and black light <laughs> and black to make lights. any of that a possibility. So is that what we're saying for, for Melissa? We're saying drop the hammer and grab a bib? <laughs> Yes, Tom, drop the hammer and grab a bib. You came up with a solution and a catchphrase. <laughs> what a terrible catchphrase. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa, for writing in and for sharing your phobia. We, uh, I, I think. Sorry, I, Melissa. I, I don't want to speak. <laughs> I don't want to speak for, for Tom, but I'm going to try. I think your anxiety may have made our lives worse. And that's yeah. why we're here. <laughs> I need to go scrub the house. (laughs) Oh my gosh, I have to burn everything down. All of it. (laughs) Pete, something wonderful happened on May 25th, 2018. That wasn't very long ago. It was not very long ago, uh, and that's what makes it all the more delicious. Um, it was actually the failure of an entire company. How mean am I? Oh, wow. To revel in the failure of a company, right? Those are real people. You're uh, like but Billionaire Boys Club. What I am... <laughs> oh, that well-known film <laughs> that made $5. <laughs> On May 25th, 2018, the website and app Clout, K-L-O-U-T, after being acquired by Lithium Technologies four years beforehand, was finally shuttered forever. Why does that make me happy? Because Clout made me feel bad. Now, do you remember what Clout was when it existed? You know, um, you're savvy, so you have a chance. Okay. I, I do. And I, I do because I actually, there was a period in my life when I was young uh, and I loved Clout. I really? loved it. Yeah, I imagine that's not something you would go for. No, for those that are not initiated to the late clout, it used Bing. <laughs> starts with Bing. Used Bing, Facebook, Foursquare, Google+, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and some other things in order to create personalized clout profiles for everyone. 
and everyone was assigned a unique clout score, which ranged from 1 to 100, with higher scores corresponding to a higher ranking of the breadth and like the presence you have on social media across the internet, how much you really right. matter and the impact you're doing. I'd never heard of it at all until I was working with my tech-savvy writing partner, Scotty P., one afternoon. He was all excited about it and asked me to sign in to see my score, because they are doing it for everyone, whether you wanted it or not. Right. Uh, and I saw my score, and it was a zero, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Out of 100, <laughs> it was a zero. And I remember thinking... I just lost a contest I didn't even enter. <laughs> like, I didn't want to be a part of this dumb clout thing, but clout said, you are, and you're terrible at it. Love the clout. So, <laughs> anyways, I bring that up because I've talked about fears of going viral uh, for the wrong reason earlier this season, and of course, I've talked a lot about technology, my fears of that, and I realize I can step way back a bit because I actually suffer from just anxiety about social media in general. I know not everyone will be able to relate to this, but I think a lot of people will, especially once we talk about it for a little bit. Well, and I bet it's growing. It, I'm sure it is. I present to you Visio Bibliophobia, from the Latin Visio, meaning face, and Biblio, meaning book. Get it? <laughs> did you just make that up? I did not. There, that is actually, it was an anxiety disorder first described by neuroscientist Justin Moretto. So it's Facebook phobia. Um, wow. I don't see that catching on a ton. It seems more jokey, but it's real. And that's what it sort of has gone down in, in scientific. Now, real quick, I just want to let you know, I'm omitting real world problems like going viral, especially if you're young, because we already talked about that. And I'm also omitting the dissemination of uh, false news articles um, on places like Face Space, because we're trying to stay fairly apolitical, at least for now. Yeah. So I'm taking those away. I think it's enough just to focus on the way that Face Space makes me feel and how it provokes anxiety in me. I boiled it down. I, I almost never check uh, face space. And oh, I just remembered I'm, I call it face space. And I don't know why <laughs> I've done that. Well, for I, years. I, yeah, I believe mean, me. I, I think we we the listener, we we know why. Yeah, because <laughs> I think a combination of Facebook. Oh, you know what it comes from? It's a combination, obviously, of Facebook and MySpace. It yeah. comes from a Law and Order SVU episode. That was about cyberbullying, and clearly they had not given, gotten the permission to use a real place. Either of so, the brands? <laughs> no, so Elliot, uh, Raging Elliot, uh, said, yeah, and uh, that's just from the top of face space. And then I think <laughs> looked at the camera and kind of gave a sorry shrug, because like, no, everyone knows that that's as dumb as Chum Hum on The yeah. Good Wife. Anyways. But you know, but there's another, there's another piece of that, and that's what I mean. Like, I, I'll tell you, I know why you call it face space, and I don't even need you to talk anymore like i oh. you you have such a like i hear the the phobia every time mm. you say it though you you diminish it by saying you diminish the, <laughs> the concept by calling it face space and this is another one of those examples of you taking like taking ownership and power of you not wanting to be in that in the face space by using a stupid word by using a stupid up. word exactly <laughs> Yeah, I think that's definitely part of it, uh, because I I don't like it. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, face space for a second. Um, and nothing I'm everything I'm going to be saying, I'm, I'm sure everyone has said tons before. I, I'm sure a lot of this is a cliche, but this is how I feel. It just feels like it's a contest to see who is happiest. It's a curated fake standard of life. That's what it's giving you uh, mixed with. You know, narcissism about the eggs you ate <laughs> yesterday. Mm -hmm. It's all highlights. It's just one nonstop highlight, highlight reel and very little actual downtime. Now, that's great news one on one. I would love to hear about my friend's accomplishments. Uh, anyone who's not a jerk would, like in a real conversation. But when you're on face base, it's just an avalanche of highlights from people across the entire country, some of whom aren't really your friends. And when you're just getting this highlight reel from everyone, it's really hard not to feel inadequate. Um, I know out here in L.A., the amount of I'm not an actor, thank God, because if I was, I would be super weird on face base because out here in L.A., <laughs> the amount of actors constantly posting hash booked it, hashtag bush it, or hashtag blessed about roles they've gotten. They must drive other actors crazy. I can only imagine what that would be because it's just like this is my chosen field and Sally is getting everything <laughs> that I'm not getting. I don't know why yeah. I'm going out for the same roles as Sally. But, well, and, and that it, by extension has destroyed so many other, you know, fantastic, like what could have been fantastic social platforms like Instagram is just, you know, it's overrun by that kind of self-promotion. And that's not what it was when it started. 
Correct. It, all of these had good intentions. And I'm not yes. saying that in general they are evil at all, but what it's become, and I'm going to get into Instagram again in one second, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, one of the ways that it really affects me is because as a result, I don't care for all of this, the highlight reel that makes me feel bad, when I don't think people are trying to make me feel bad, but that's just sort of no. how it comes. What gets lost uh, in the flood of nonsense is sometimes important news. Unfortunately, for the last, like, Five or six or seven years, some of my friends have started announcing really big news just on FaceSpace. When instead of like writing a group email, I think I'm the only person that still writes group emails about news, good or bad. Uh, mm -hmm. So I miss out when I used to be very in the know about stuff. I think it damages actual flesh and blood relationships. How so? I think it gives people a sense that they are staying close to their friends when actually it's just an artifice that so little is often accomplished by writing a post and getting a like or vice versa. It make I think it can make certain people feel like, oh, I've got my finger on everybody and everybody's doing great and I know and I'm really together with my friends. Whereas I feel like you need actual conversation for that. Or well, ideally, of course, a face to face. If you can meet for lunch or anything like that, that just checking in and liking the highlight reel, you're not you're getting maybe 10% of the story of what they're going through, if they're if they're if they have anxiety about things, the problems mm -hmm. they're facing, if they need back. I mean, just pressing like I think it gives you a real quick, probably dopamine uh, feel or a push of just like, oh, I like this person. He or she and I just connected. And I just don't think that's true. And I think mm -hmm. that a lot of people are getting, for, especially as we get older and move across the country, that uh, people are growing apart a bit and don't even know it. And I'm one of those that's really torn because I spent so many years loving the, all those tools, right? When we mm -hmm. first got into it, you know, in the early part of, of the 2000s, it was so much fun and engaging to find all these people that you hadn't been in contact with as they start kind of populating these networks from MySpace to Facebook to, you know, as you watch the networks kind of take over. And then I, I read this book uh, and I, I don't know, I hope you're not going to talk about it and that this is this is actually I'm not taking anything from you. The book is Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom. I have read that book, but you're not taking anything away from me. Please talk about uh, it. I love that book. Yeah. Well, you know, this book, it's by Cory Doctorow, Doctorow. And, and Cory is not only is he a fantastic author, he's also a, a digital rights activist, right? He mm -hmm. lives in this incredible space online and has cultivated uh, quite a discussion uh, around uh, so many of these topics. But this book in, partic in particular introduced me to this concept of woofy. You remember woofy? No, I don't. Woofy, it, it's popularity. It's like reputation points that when you are in a virtualized community, these reputation points are sort of always like broadcast over your head you know it's been a long a movie came or the book came out in 2003 it's been a long time since i've read it but it that concept stuck with me that the artifice of reputation or that reputation was being turned into artifice that had it like a currency and mm. uh, and and measuring like that black reputation. mirror episode yes 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 yes, yes with bryce, with bryce dallas howard, bryce dallas howard. Like, exactly so yeah that can be spent. And that, when you opened with this story of clout, that's what clout was, right? Clout yeah, took yeah. all of your activity and bundled it up into a score, into a, your clout score was woofy. And if you stopped posting, it would go down. And so then we get into the, you, you know, the circle, right? The the book, which I didn't really like. The movie was okay. But, but that concept of watching this score, this amalgamated score go down as your activity went down, like taking, giving no permission for you to ever slow down and absorb the world around you, that impacted me in, in I think, a negative way, at least my impression of these networks in a negative way. And it made me just sort of change my perspective. So every Thing you're talking about hits hits home and i it, it hurts me a little bit because you know i had a, a dear old college friend who wrote me on facebook messenger two weeks ago and i just never check it and i missed that he's driving through my town this week um, I, it yeah. hurts me that i'm not there in some areas where that could have led to a real life hug you know it could right. have led to a real life connection so i'll stop monologuing no but yeah but if that has become because it's so easy yeah. If that has become the general uh, way of delivering news or updates, then yeah, I know I'm missing out. Yes. Um, and I, and I, but I also have friends um, that are completely off Facebook and don't use it at all and have never signed yeah. up for it. And they seem to be doing fine. <laughs> yeah. God. You have talked before about 
uh, in a cold opens and stuff about the danger of social media um, mm-hmm. to reiterate, according to a 2017 survey by the Royal Society for Public Health in the United Kingdom, uh, social media has been described as more addictive than cigarettes and alcohol. Um, and in that same study, oh, there's a really great phrase that I liked. Instagram was decided to be the most damaging social media platform on mental health. It causes, it can cause for a lot of people high levels of anxiety and depression because all you're seeing is people, again, who might not even be your friends. They're out on trips or they're enjoying nights out or they have the most beautiful food, everything, everything, everything that can make you feel like you're missing out, not doing enough with your life. These feelings promote a quote, compare and despair attitude. Oh, I'd love that. Compare and despair, where you look at what someone else has and wonder what's wrong with you that you don't have the same thing. Which is so sad because Instagram, of all of them, when I first joined Instagram, I joined it for the photography and I joined it to share my own photography and mm-hmm. uh, and not lifestyle. Right. I didn't do it to showcase cars I was accidentally in or uh, you know, <laughs> like all the places I traveled, I did it to share the photography. That's what it was about. And it became something that it was that it, I feel a little bit betrayed by Instagram. There is something really melancholy about because I was not an early adopter to any of these things. So I missed out on maybe what's <laughs> really? feeling as the the good. Yeah, really. What a surprise. Right. <laughs> I think I just figured out how to open Minesweeper. Um, but the point <laughs> is that I missed out on the fun part. And now it's just this relentless self-promotion and stuff. Um, I was able to find a lot of articles, as I've already sort of mentioned a little bit about the dangers of social media and really the solution that are uh, put out there, you know, of course, are don't use it or walk away. That's not really easy for many people. The thing that really helps me that I just have to remember is it's not real. I use the phrase highlight reel. That's all it is. It's a highlight reel. It's all for show. Mm -hmm. And it's not what people are really necessarily living. And so, I mean, I could fake. Well, wait, now I'm making myself sound sad. I was saying I could fake a highlight reel if I felt that that would make me feel better because I am lucky. I do have a very nice life. Right. And I do have a and nice friend. And you also happen to be a filmmaker. Like, you literally could fake a highlight reel. <laughs> right, exactly. That would be delightful. Yeah, I can yeah. edit out all the ugly people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I just have to remember that, that because even when I know that in my heart of hearts, sometimes if I do wander on to face space, usually to promote something, uh, which I know I'm part of the problem, not promote something, yes. that's, but like promoting this podcast. This, when this podcast comes me. out. Oh, God. I'm going to put out and share. And I feel okay with that because that's trying to bring something that I feel will bring people joy. and isn't just look at this hat I'm wearing or look at these eggs I ate. But when I'm on there doing it, I do scroll through a little bit and it immediately makes me remember I do not want to be here. (laughs) But see, I feel like that uh, that is what you just said. That is the part that really puts me in a space of of conflict because Mm. I, uh, you know, I find I am less healthy emotionally when I spend too much time on Facebook and Instagram, I am better off when I delete it from my phone and my, you know, and, and not make it a bookmark. Uh, yeah. And yet part of my livelihood hinges on people being able to find the work that I do. Yep. And I and so in, you know, insofar as I would naturally just I, I would dump it if I if I could. My my job requires me to share there and it requires me to be able to tap into a community of people who are interested in the other work that I'm doing. That's not on Facebook and that crushes me. So I think that what we have just decided is if you want to get the show, send us your physical address because we'll write you a letter (laughs) every week. You know what we'll do? We'll send you a transcript like the old Phil Donahue shows. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) You'll get this leather-bound book about how ants taste great. (laughs) But it's it's only at the end of the season. There's only one book with the transcripts for 12 episodes in it annotated. Right. And it'll be perfect. It'll be perfect. I can't wait. One of the interesting parts is uh, that I'm sure not personally, but some algorithm or something in Facebook knows that I do not show up very much, that I show up and do something and then leave it. Because it has started sending me notifications from friends where it'll say, like, TJ just made a comment. And so clearly it's about me. (laughs) And I click on it and it's like, you know what's big? Horses. And I'm like, why am I looking at that? (laughs) Like, it's finding new ways to make it seem like I'm missing out on a conversation. But they have nothing to do with me. They're just someone tried on a hat. But they're so desperate for me to uh, log in that they're trying whatever they can. 
two things. One is uh, the, the first one is that I have found myself really spending my time online in smaller network places. And I'm in this case, I'm speaking specifically of Discord and Slack mm-hmm. a little bit, but less. The communities that I have on these two places are communities of intention, right? The people who are in these groups are people who want to be there, who I know and have a relationship with, even if it's a relationship that is exists exclusively online, we're all there as a smaller community of people who intentionally go there. There's no, um, just, right. The, like we it's joined a fil- this There's a group. filter there. Yeah. Exactly. You're like we joined this group with a, a mission to continue our lives together online when we're not physically, physically together. And that means something more to me. It's more entertaining. It's more fun. We have more shared interests and we, we don't have uh, as much of the eggs discussion, right? Right. <laughs> uh, and so I really like that, and I've uh, I have I've really grown to that. And the Discord groups that we've created around our uh, our podcast, like some of the best, most interesting conversations, mm-hmm. happen there and yeah. not on Facebook. And I think that's a sign, and certainly a trend that that we're not alone. Um, right. You know. Yeah. So so that's number one. Number two is, and this is a problem that goes back to an episode that we talked about where your anxiety was about uh, the robot uprising. Do you remember that? <laughs> yep. <laughs> you said uh, you were talking about TJ and the algorithm. And that right there is another big problem I have that I don't want my friendships, my relationships mm. managed by an algorithm that drives me batty. Right. It right. makes me heart sick. And, and that's another reason I really like, you know, these uh, smaller groups like Discord, because those conversations aren't filtered by an algorithm. I just get what is posted. And if I want to scroll back and look at everything, I can scroll back and look at everything. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of them have gone away from the idea of a continuous stream of conversation and they now filter posts because of they they post what they think you they want you to, that you want to see and they don't know right. what I want to see to keep you coming back to keep exactly. you coming back yeah and they're exceptionally good at it and I feel uh I feel like I'm I'm being used and that's a very difficult thing to to come to terms with I think it's disgusting get out of my head you damned robot <laughs> Oh, that old chestnut. <laughs> well, Pete, if it makes you feel any better, in my heart, your clout score is 100. <laughs> Yours is still zero. <laughs> <laughs> that checks out. I yeah, get it. I yeah, get it. yeah, that was it. Yeah. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free oh. audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash scent of a podcast. Over 187,000, <laughs> over 187 titles to choose from. <laughs> no, seriously, a lot of titles to choose from. I guarantee there's stuff there you haven't been read yet. You need to check it out on your iPhone, your Android, your Kindle, your other generic MP3 player, maybe a Zoom. You should check it out. Tommy, what do you got? Actually, the book that I would like to offer listeners is the one that you brought up during my anxiety. It is The Circle by Dave Eggers. In the book, May Holland is hired to work for The Circle, which might as well be Google. It's the world's most powerful internet company, and she thinks she's been given the opportunity of a lifetime for a lot of the same reasons that we talked about in my anxiety about the need for social media media, the importance put on that, she decides, she begins to understand that what she thought was a utopia is much more dystopian at heart. I know that doesn't sound like a super fun (laughs) book to read, (laughs) but I promise it's very well uh, written. He is also, of course, the author of a heartbreaking work of Staggering Genius, which won him a Pulitzer Prize and which is also amazing. The Circle by Dave Eggers is narrated by Dion Graham, who is an amazing uh, voiceover artist. It is 13 hours and 42 minutes long. So, you know, like the all the medicine that you normally would have to take over the next few weeks, maybe just take it all now, just as a real time saver, and just plow through this audio recording that is The Circle by Dave Eggers. Pete? Just the stimulants. Just the stimulants. Yeah, yeah yes. That is uh, terrible advice, but a fantastic <laughs> uh, book pick. I actually really enjoyed this, uh, it, it enjoyed the concepts in this book, particularly when you start getting into uh, the relationship between employee and the company. And it is this book, man, it it pushes on some of those things hard. Uh, it's a great yep. pick for you. The listeners of What's That Smell Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30 day trial. Look at all the 
freeze in Woo! that sentence. So much free. You get the opportunity to check out the service, browse the books, listen to a whole lot of samples, hundreds of thousands of samples before you actually dig into the, the book you want to get. www.audibletrial.com slash scent of a podcast. Get that book, The Circle by Dave Eggers today. And folks, as you know, we do not pay to advertise this show, so we appreciate you sharing it with others you think would be interested. Those five-star reviews in iTunes and Apple Podcasts, if you haven't done it yet, I promise you it is very easy, and it really helps us spread the word about this show. So if you like what you've heard, share the love with a review, and maybe put in a little something funny in there if you want to. Coming up next week... So sorry. Oh my God. I'm surprised you even showed up today. Yeah, that was time really well spent. I have tinfoil hats <laughs> for my tinfoil hat. <laughs> This is legit. You can look this. I mean, I did. I took a look. You can look this. Hey, finish that. Set. You, you can, can look it up. You can look it up. <laughs> I do not have an anxiety about the German language, German people, or the study of German and things that are German. Good, because that would just be racist. <laughs> <That> <laughs> this week's tune has been On My Own by Torelli and the Fuse. Thank you all so much for listening. I'm Tommy Metz III. And I'm Pete Wright. We'll be back next week on What's That Smell? When the winter's cold, I'm looking for a lover. Love interest, I want to be a lover. Love her from my bed, love them all the time. Give her what she wants when she tells me that she's mine. But I'm just a dreamer, no girl seeming to live up to that. And that is just a fact. So